So all of you might remember a while back about the time I opened a booster box of the failed trading card game Beast Clans, and how, due to a mistake with the foil slot, my box contained exactly zero rare cards in it? Now what if I told you that Monster Crown, which just came out, has basically the opposite problem? So Monster Crown, the TCG whose Kickstarter I covered as part of my video series, is finally getting its products into the hands of players. The card game, based on the video game of the same name, sees a sort of king of the hill fight between players where the goal is to knock all of your opponent's monsters out of their crown slots so they have none left. So after I put my blood, sweat, and tears into making them a how to play video, what do they do? They go and change the rules! Why? There are really only two major changes in the game. Firstly, with the crown slots. They used to count up 1, 2, 3, now they count up 1, 3, 5, with monsters of new crown ratings ranging from 1 to 6 rather than 1 to 4. I don't really understand this change, because due to how the zones were changed, a CR4 monster is functionally identical to a CR5 monster when it comes to getting demoted. I guess if it has any effect is that it makes certain boss monsters less stable since there are literally no exact matches for their crown rating? Seems like an odd play, really. The other change is that now you can play monsters in the back row, known as the world slots. These wild monsters do not count as monsters for the purpose of the win condition and cannot challenge monsters in crown slots. Instead, wild monsters exist more to interact with the other card types and maybe be used to perform a gene surge. Monsters can now expend to interact with quests and NPCs, knocking them down a peg and even activating their effects in certain cases. The set of five starter monsters is now more like a Lurig deck you can change to contain different starters and new ally cards. Since you pick your starter at the beginning of each game, it opens up a little counterplay, though K Knight is still the safest choice. The signature monster of each starter deck has also been converted into monster and tamer cards, each with their own special rules. And speaking of starter decks, let's talk about what Monster Crown sent me. There are currently two starter decks, one for the main character Alex and another for the leading antagonist Beth. Both decks have a solid offering of a deck containing full playsets of every exclusive card, a hand-drawn rulebook, a separate playmat and checklist, nice, and a bonus booster pack, also nice. But now let's talk about this box and a common issue with printing on the cheap, Language Barrier. Now, if you are an independent game, odds are good you are probably going to be printing out of China. They're cheaper and often more communicative than the bigwig companies who won't give smaller projects the time of day. The cost for this is, of course, a generally lower quality product, a long delivery time, and at times mistakes that would never happen with people who speak your language natively. In this case, the mistake was that the cards at every rarity were all printed at the same ratio. Commons, uncommons, rares, and super rares were printed at a ratio of 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, with each card appearing in equal quantity. You are as likely to get a pack with zero rares in it as you are to get a pack with eight rares in it, or five super rares in it. You will, of course, get more commons, as there are more commons than any other type of card in the set, but you can see how crazy this is. I got more rare cards than I got uncommon cards. The super rares in this game are supposed to appear at a rate of 1 to 3 packs, but my booster box contained a grand total of 27 super rares, more than one per pack. I pulled complete playsets of every single rare and super rare card, and ironically enough, thanks to pulling the true rare death card, the only cards I was missing from this set were three uncommons, one of which was one of the starter monsters. Kinda wish the starter decks included a full set of those, to be honest. It's an odd problem for a card game to have, where the rare cards are delivered generously and the commons and uncommons are the ones that are hard to accumulate. It does mean that the Kickstarter boxes could be allowed to spike in value due to their absurd rarity density, and the best companion to one of these boxes would be a completely normal box with normal ratios. The irony though are the foil slots. When I said this box was the opposite of Beast Clans, I meant it, as ironically enough, the foil slots are the only slots that were handled correctly, meaning that the cards that only exist as foil cards, the brilliant, dream, full art, and true rarities are still as rare as they ought to be. 
So death decks will still be hard to come by, as death is the only mechanically unique card locked to the foil slot, being equivalent to the legendary rarity in Flesh and Blood. It is thankfully a place at one card, so you really only need one to get going. The amount of box chaff, once foils were taken into account, is 42, which is, eh, a basic B-. Like I said, the perfect number is 0, but 42 is low enough that I don't feel like much went to waste and can be gifted to the curious who want to try, but the insane part is that of those 42 cards, 20 of them are rare or higher. It is just wild. So yes, they do still have some stock left, and other goodies like mats and pins are still in transit, but if you want one of the weirdest box opening experiences ever, or even the craziest casual draft play, go ahead and grab yourself a box. Oh, one more thing. They also sent me probably one of the favorite presents I have ever been sent. Test foils! These are test cards from the factory demonstrating how the parallel, brilliant, and full art cards look when fully foiled, but before the ink is applied. Makes for a fun challenge of... Who's that monster man? Card foiling is actually a fascinating process because, you see, ink is transparent. It actually takes an additional something for most inks to be opaque. You normally don't see this thanks to the fact that stuff is usually printed onto white paper where there is no effect on the final colors, but foiling adds a new wrinkle. You see, foiling effects like those found in Pokemon are not carefully cut out of the cards, they are in fact an entire layer. If you look closely, you can even see some of the foiling passing through the covering they put on top of it. Basically, a carefully crafted layer of whiteout, creating an opaque surface for the transparent ink to be applied to. When combined, this allows us to have cards with a foiled background, but regular critters, or vice versa in the case of the brilliant foils. So yeah, there you have it. Monster Crown with a fun bonus in the forms of seeing how some of the sausage gets made. I believe they are already working on set 2 which introduces hybrid monsters to the mix alongside the development of the Monster Crown 2 video game. Fun! Gonna go try to make a death deck now, so until next time, this is Kodak signing off.